Today's message is entitled Love Speech. So what's that all about? How many have heard of hate speech? Christians are being accused of hate speech all the time anymore. And we're going to look at some things in God's Word, things that we're told that we're being hateful when we talk about them, and we'll see that we're not being hateful, we're also actually showing love. But it's kind of an important topic. I, I had an article here from CBS News about, it says the Bible is criminal, according to a British court. What? It says uh, there were two street preachers were preaching in England, and they were arrested. It said the public prosecutor in the case claimed that publicly quoting parts of the King James Bible in modern Britain should be considered to be abusive and is a criminal matter. Think about that. Just quoting the King James Bible. Prosecutor Jack, Ian Jackson also told the court to say some, to someone that Jesus is the only way to God is not a matter of truth to the extent that they are saying that the only way to God is through Jesus, but that cannot be the truth. We know that to be a truth. And just because somebody doesn't believe it doesn't mean we have no right to say it. We have the right to speak the truth. So as the men explained the difference between Islam and Christianity using the Bible references to the Quran, they spoke of God's love and the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. This was captured on video by the police. It says the video also records the police officers saying to Oberg, one of the preachers, um, that he was preaching homophobia and challenging Muslims, to which Oberg responded that he and the other preachers were just saying what the Bible says. So they're being accused of hate speech because they're merely quoting the Bible. And it's not just in England, it's happening in America. I've watched on TV just this week, I saw two news articles relating, news broadcasts relating to what I'm going to be talking about this morning. But they're trying to silence the church. But we're going to take a look at that. Is it hate speech like they're calling it? I'm going to hope we leave today and see that it's actually love speech. Romans 5, 6, and 9 says, for, five, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That's love. God himself died for us to show us his love. And that's what the gospel is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. It's about God's love. But sometimes we make a mistake of thinking that God is only love. Today they say God is love. God wouldn't condemn anybody for sin. But God is also holy. God is set apart in holiness. He cannot be in the presence of sin. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31, The Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you are in sin, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of God. Even though He's a God of love, He's also a God of judgment. He must judge sin. And He will judge sin. This thing that God is not going to judge anybody's sin and anything goes now because God is love. It's just not true. The Bible teaches that God is a holy God. The idea behind the concept of holiness is separation. It comes from a word meaning to separate or cut off. God is separate or cut off from everything that is sinful and evil. He cannot tolerate sin. So while God is love, He is also holy. So what is hate speech that we hear about? Hate speech is defined as speech that attacks, threatens, or insults a person or group on the basis of national origin, ethnicity, color, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability. That's how they define hate speech today. So there are some moral issues involved in this list that sometimes we speak out against. It's not hate speech. It's merely saying what the Bible teaches. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? I have to ask myself all the time. When God puts certain things on my heart to talk about, and I'm going, well, I don't really want to talk about that. 
You know, I'm not going to offend some people. It reminds me that he doesn't say anywhere in his word that you are guaranteed freedom against being offended. Yeah. Jesus offended people. <laughs> Quite a few, if you read the Gospels, he offended the people in his own hometown. They wanted to stone him because of proclaiming who he was. Gospel, at times, is an offense to people. But who are we trying to please? Are we trying to seek the favor of men or of God? We need to ask ourselves that question all the time because sometimes we're going to be in a situation where we have to defend what God says and we may offend somebody. But who do you want to please? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul is saying, if I really wanted to please men, I couldn't be a bondservant of Christ. If you're a bondservant of Christ, that means you are serving Him by your own will, your own desire. A bondservant was a servant who decided he didn't want to, when he was set free, he didn't want to go free from the family because he loved them so much. He wanted to stay serving them. And he'd become a bondservant. They'd take him and put his ear against the doorpost and drive him all through it. Nail him to the doorpost. Well, somebody went, ah, oh, but you pierce your ears. It's just a form of ear piercing in a sense. Yeah. But with a all, it was a pretty big but that was showing that he was nailed to that household. They didn't leave him there. That was just, oh. that was just a symbolic thing. <laughs> they let you loose, you know. You probably wore an earring, I don't know. But it was just symbolic that you were bound to that, that home. Well, we're a bondservant of Christ. We are bound to him. So Ezekiel 3, 18-19 says, When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you will not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But God is saying, if he says that something's wicked, you're going to die in that wickedness, and you don't warn that person, you know that it's wicked, you don't warn them, their blood guilt is on you. You will be held guilty for not warning them. So yet, if you have warned the wicked, he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Doesn't mean they're going to change, but if you warn them, you freed yourself from being held accountable. It goes on to say again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die, since you have not warned him. So even people within our own church family, if you see somebody doing something that's wrong, you need to warn them. He says, but his blood will, I will require at your hand. We don't warn them. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning and you have delivered yourself. It's something that we need to learn as Christians that we are held accountable. If we know somebody is in sin, we need to warn them. It doesn't mean they're going to respond, but you've relieved yourself of that guilt by warning them. Secular society rebels against all forms of opposition to sin. They try to make godly people appear to be wrong if we speak against sin. They call us hate mongers, homophobes, misogynists, among other things. And people don't like to be called names, so they avoid these things. They don't want to be called a name. But one of the problems in our society today is we've taken sin and we've given it other titles. Now we call sin a disease or a lifestyle choice. See, we don't call it what it is, sin. We need to go back to the Bible. The Bible calls some of these things sin, and we need to call it out as sin. But we need to do it in love. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak of a couple different issues today, but those aren't the only issues of sin. And I'll say there are a lot of others. They're all equal. You ever tell a lie? That's no different than some of them that I'm going to talk about, the sin. I'm just going to focus on a couple because these are ones that society is really focusing on attacking the church for speaking out against them. But sin is sin. Mm -hmm. We're to love the person and warn them of the sin. We need to learn to be able to do that in love. Most Christians, when it comes to confronting sin, just roll over, play dead, and leave it for someone else. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be like a good lap dog and just roll over and play dead every time we're supposed to confront sin. That's the comfortable way to do it, easy way. Oh, just play dead. Maybe they'll move on. Mm -hmm. If you call homosexuality a sin, you are called a homophobe and accused of hate speech. Did you know that? Mm 
See, today they call it a lifestyle choice. They say people are born this way. It's not a sin. They have no choice. God wouldn't judge somebody for a way they are born. We're going to take a look at this and see what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? And I'm focusing on this not because it's the only bad sin. Only because it's one that the church is really under attack right now. They're trying to silence the church on this issue. But what does the Bible say? We need to know what the Bible says. So what does the Bible say about homosexuality? We're going to look at this as the, the idea here of the child that's about to burn themselves on the stove. That's how we need to approach issues like this. If you have a child and they're about to touch a hot stove, what are you going to do? Watch them do it? Come on, parents, what are you going to do if your child's about to touch a hot stove? You're going to grab them and pull them away and say, don't touch that. That's the same thing we're doing to the sinner when we tell them you're, what you're doing is sin and there is judgment coming for your sin. You need to ask God to forgive you. We're pulling them away from the punishment. Just like you pull a child away from a hot stove. I mean, that should be an automatic reaction to any parent. It should be an automatic reaction to any of us if we see somebody about to harm themselves to pull them away and say, don't do that. So is it harm? We need to remember, too, God does not hate the homosexual. He hates the sin of homosexuality. Let that sink in. God does not hate homosexuals. We should not hate homosexuals. We should love them. They're in sin. Any more than we should hate somebody that's committed the sin of adultery, the sin of lying, any other than the list of sins, sin of drunkenness. We don't hate them. We want to love them out of their sin and into a relationship with Christ. You're not going to reach anybody through hate, are you? I don't want to go bash them for their lifestyle. If they call it, it's a sin. But we need to, when we have opportunity, speak out to it. Say, you know, this is what the Bible says. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to tell them God gives you a way of escape. You know, churches used to have ministries to help homosexual, homosexuals get out of the homosexual lifestyle. We were in a big church in Sacramento. There was a young man, a hairdresser, that gave his heart to the Lord. He was a homosexual, became a heterosexual. God healed him, and he had a ministry to help other homosexuals come out of that lifestyle. But today, churches are trying to do that. They're being condemned. It's called hate speech. It's said to be hateful. There used to be counselors you could go to for that because it was considered, and it is a mental disorder. You're not born that way. But now you can't even do that anymore. Counselors don't have counseling centers to help them. They get shut down. Mm -hmm. Because now we want to call it a lifestyle. See, we've done the sin. I'm just using this as one example because it's one that's very obvious in society. We've done it with other sins. God's law defines homosexuality as sin. Leviticus 18, 22, and 23 says, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It's an abomination. It's pretty plain, isn't it? Speaking of men. Men, you are not to lie with a female and say... A male in the same way you lie with a female. If you want to know what the word lies in there means to have sex. It's speaking of homosexuality. Also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. These sins listed right here were called sodomy. The word to lie with, ibah. Something disgusting and important, especially, I don't know, this is a, an abomination, excuse me. The word abomination, because some people try to misinterpret what that is, but it is something disgusting, abhorrence, especially for idolatry or an idol. Um, an abomination is often used to describe idolatry, and some suggest that these verses are not condemning homosexual behavior in general, but only the cultic prostitution connected with pagan temples. That's the argument that the homosexuals make. They say these verses in Leviticus have nothing to do with their lifestyle, what they're doing today. These have to do with prostitutes and pagan temple worship. And it's only because God was separating Israel from the world, and so he was giving specific instructions to them, but it was okay for the rest of the world. That's nonsense. Because abomination isn't just something that has to do with idolatry. An abomination can also have can have nothing to do with idolatry. We see that in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, where it says there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination. Same word. This has nothing to do with idolatry. 
It says, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among his brothers. None of those have to do with idol worship, do they? But they're an abomination. So abomination doesn't just mean something that's tied to idol worship. So that argument is, is a false argument. <clears throat> In Leviticus 20, 13 through 16, it says, If there is a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a, feet, with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. It's the same word that's translated abomination in the earlier verse. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guilt is, is upon them. <clears throat> now one of the arguments today against this, and they say, well, <clears throat> we're no longer under the law. Well, no, we don't sentence people to death for these sins any longer because Christ paid the price for the sin, but it's still sin. Is the argument. Some people say we're no longer under the law, but it is still sin. Romans 7, 7 says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Some people say we're not under the law. So Paul addresses this. He says, may it never be on the contrary. I would not have come to know sin except through the law. God's law is to show us what sin is. So it tells us what sin is. That's the purpose of the law. We are no longer under the law in the sense that we are no longer under the law's judgment in Christ. But we still have the law to tell us what sin is. Matthew 5, 17 to 19 says, Do not think that I come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. See, a lot of people quote the first part. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Therefore, Jesus fulfilled it. We no longer have to pay attention to God's law. It's a false argument. Because he's saying that if you nullify any of it, you're least in the kingdom of God. We're not to nullify the law. We just have to understand he fulfilled it in the sense that we're no longer under the law's judgment when we accept Christ as our Savior. So some argue that homosexuality is natural, therefore God would not condemn it. What we hear all the time. It's hate speech because this is natural. You can't condemn something. God would never condemn something that's natural. People are born this way. You know what? There is no scientific study anywhere that shows that people are born gay. In fact, the most recent scientific studies are showing just the opposite. This red one. They said that the homosexual community has more psychological problems than any community, other community, a group of people. If it were natural, they wouldn't have those problems. But they do. It's not natural. Romans 1, 26 and 28 tells us that. It says, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function of that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. So they abandoned what? The natural function for something that is unnatural. It's not natural, it's unnatural. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved minds to do those things which are not proper. So we see what God's Word says. It's not a good thing. But again, I want to remind you, we love the person. We don't hate homosexuals. They're good people. They're being deceived. We need to reach them with the love of God. But remember back, we talked about in Ezekiel, it says that if you know somebody's in sin, and you don't warn them of that sin, you're held guilty for their sin. God requires us to warn people. So if you have the opportunity, in a conversation with one, you have to do it in love. But let them know what God's Word says. Mark 10, 6-9 says, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. From the very beginning, God made us male and female. Probably heard it said he created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's how we were created, male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. 
Right there in those verses, we see the whole issue of gay marriage. God ordained marriage in the beginning between a man and a woman. The church tried to fight that battle, but caved on it. And it's silent now on gay marriage. It's not marriage. I don't care what they call it. It's not marriage. The Bible defines marriage. And just so you know where I stood, I was never against, uh, they call it the unions, but they had a, that's what they call that more. Civil union. Or, oh. There's nothing wrong with that. We get them can because look, they, they do have equal rights under the law. If it's a civil union, that's fine, but it's not marriage. You know, they're in sin. I don't agree with it, but they have a right to be have equality under the law. We all do. Because our Constitution guarantees us equal rights, but it doesn't guarantee that they have the right to marriage. The Bible defines marriage. Our Constitution didn't define marriage. That was defined in the beginning. 1 Corinthians 6 through 11 also says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now I want you to listen to this list. I know I'm picking on, I said I was picking on one sin only because this is one sin that we're called hate speech when we talked about it. But you need to know it's not the only sin that God's talking about. He says, neither fornicators. Could go into a whole sermon on fornication. That's sin outside of marriage. It's a sin. It's in the Bible. That's what fornication is. It says, nor idolaters. Worshiping idols. Nor adulterers. We can forgive adulterers, but some people can't forgive homosexuals. It's equal in God's eyes. Nor the effeminate. Nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards. These are all sins. Nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There's the warning. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why we are to warn them. I know I'm picking on one of them only because that one's in the news. And the church is being attacked by it. But they're trying to take our right to speak out on any of this, any moral issue. Ran into that in the meeting at the county this week. Somebody came up after I had spoken. They complained about separation of church and state, telling them you should not legislate morality. And I'm going, wait a second, we legislate morality all the time. We have laws against murder. That's a moral issue. We have laws against child abuse. That's a moral issue. Laws against spousal abuse. That's a moral issue. You go on and on. We have lots of laws against moral issues. We legislate morality all the time. It just drives me nuts when people use that argument. That's right. Well, when they're, you know, when they're um, protecting or saying they have a right to that, they're uh, actually they're infringing on our rights to uh, to. You know, what God says. Yeah. 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 Freedom of religion. And I did. I went up to a gal that, that mentioned, that complained about me speaking because I did mention I was a pastor. Saying, you know, we shouldn't have this because it's separation of church and state. I went up to her afterwards and I asked her real politely, very kind. I said, you know, I, I was a little confused. I said, I've read the Constitution. I said, maybe you could tell me where in the Constitution it says separation of church and state because I'd like to go home and look it up. She goes, well, it's not in the Constitution. I looked at it and said, exactly. Oh. <laughs> I said, you know where it came from? From the founding of this country. And I said, no. How many know where that phrase came from? A letter. You. It came from a letter by Thomas Jefferson. He wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association because they were afraid that in their state, their state constitution had no guarantee of freedom of religion, and he wanted to know that if their free expression of religion was going to be guaranteed by the constitution, and he wrote to him and said, yes, there's a separation of church and state, and to, you are guaranteed your free exercise of religion. But they turned it around to be just the opposite, that it means that we're to silence religion. That's not what it ever meant. It meant that the state cannot interfere with our right to exercise our freedom of religion. But it's twisted around. Don't matter. They'll keep twisting it. But anyway, it says, when it gives this whole list of sins, let's look at that again. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, and drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But he goes on to say, such were some of you. Oh, yep. wow. wow. There comes the arrow to the heart. Because we are all somewhere on 
on that list at one time. It says, but you were what? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. There's the love speech right there. Because anybody in these sins can be washed. They can be set free. We just need to let them know. That's our job. 1 Timothy 8-11 says, But we know that the law is good. What is the law? Is the law bad? See, that's the argument they always use. Not under the law, the law is bad. Timothy says the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Realize the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. For the ungodly and the sinner, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. All these things he listed, contrary to sound teaching. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. A homosexual is no more a sinner than the guy or girl who have casual sex together. It's good for Christians to be concerned about homosexuality, but not to the point where they are pinpointing that one sin and placing it above all others. That needs to be our attitude in the church. It's no greater sin. Is a homosexual welcome in our church? Yes, they are. But they're going to hear the truth. When I was at a church, on staff at a church in Elk Grove, I had, after we had a big 4th of July outreach in the community, I was in on Monday, I was the old pastor in, and this gal called, she said, you know, I'm a lesbian and I want to know, am I welcome in your church? She's trying to set me up. And I said, yes, you are. You're more than welcome to come. She says, well, what do you feel about that? And I said, well, everybody's welcome in our church. I said, occasionally, when it comes up in Scripture, we're going to speak out against your lifestyle. And I just want to warn you, in case you find that offensive, but you're, it's not meant to be offensive. They won't, well, you don't, aren't welcoming me then. I'm like, no. I finally said, if you'd like to come down and see what the Bible says, sit down with me and we'll talk one-on-one -on -one across my desk, I'd be more than happy to do that. But I'm not going to get in an argument with you over the phone. Because you're just trying to set me up. And she, Hung up, never came in. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk about it. But they're trying to set us up. Just gotta be careful sometimes too. Deuteronomy 22 5 says, A woman shall not wear a man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing. Whoever does this thing is an abomination to the Lord our God. Another verse. All these verses dealing with a particular lifestyle are in the scripture. Confusing. It's not what God meant things to be. So what about another area of hate speech? We're saying if you oppose abortion, you hate women. That's what they're telling the church. We hate women. Especially men, if you stand out speaking against this issue, they think you're a, a member of the Hate the Women Club. tissue mass. That's what we're told. An unborn child is just an unviable tissue mass. That means it's worthless. Has no life. What does the Bible tell us? Does the Bible tell us that the unborn is an unviable tissue mass? No. Mm -hmm. Psalm 139, 13-14 says, For you form my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Who's forming that infant in the womb? Because here God is forming the infant. What right do we have to destroy what God is forming? What right do we have to stand in the way of the hand of God? Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Says he even knew you before he began forming you. 
So that means he knows you at every stage of your development in the womb. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. He has consecrated us in the womb before we're even born. Luke 1, 43 and 44 says, And now has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. When Mary approached Elizabeth, John the Baptist, unborn in her womb, leapt for joy, showed emotion, yeah. recognizing the presence of the Lord there. An unviable tissue mass has no emotion, does not leap for joy. This is a life in the womb. So Exodus 20, 13 says, you shall not murder. It's pretty simple. Murder is taking innocent life. Now, I know some of Bibles have said it says, you shall not kill, but the word in the original means murder. That means the taking of an innocent life. What is more innocent than the unborn child? So the abortion rate by religion. Those that have no religion, 36.2% of them have abortions. Mainstream Protestants, 24.2% have abortions. That's almost a quarter of them. Something's wrong in the church. Among the Catholics, and they're the strong, they stand probably stronger than any others against abortion, 23.8% have abortions. Other religion, 16.0. Evangelical Christians have the lowest rate of abortions, 13.4. You'd think it would be zero. But we're not doing enough to get the word out and to offer other op opportunities. And, you know, there's no such thing as an unwanted child. Yeah. Every child in the womb, there's somebody somewhere that wants that child. There are a lot of people that can't have children and would love to adopt one. Adoption is a viable option, but we have to love that person and stand beside them and be willing to invest the time in them because they're going through a tough time. They have a child they didn't want. But somebody wants it. God wants that child. We need to steer them in the right direction and get these numbers down even further. You know, the church used to be very active on this subject. It's almost silent now. Mm -hmm. I just saw a newscast that was saying that, I can't remember what state it was, but they're trying to silence a church that's protesting out in front of abortion clinics. They're, they're out of the way. They're just holding signs and they're trying to offer counsel to women coming in, but they're being told that they're hate mongers and that they're blocking it. It's not okay, they weren't blocking it at all. What was upsetting them is that women were actually turning away and not having the abortion. It's big money. You know, look at where did Planned Parenthood start? Yeah. How many know where the beginning of Planned Parenthood was? Margaret Sanger founded Planned Parenthood on October 16, 1916 in order to eliminate what she thought were inferior races. That was the reason for Planned Parenthood. She wanted to get rid of Orientals, Jews, and Blacks. She referred to them as human weeds. It was part of the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement was the idea to get rid of human weeds, every undesirable human, through forced sterilization or abortion. That's what Planned Parenthood was all about. Our president was part of that too, Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. The guy that started the IRS. Yeah, also behind it. But she said the most merciful thing that a large family does is to one of its infant members is to kill it. That was her attitude. And you know what? She was hailed as a hero by many politicians during the last election, including one that was running for president. Yeah. That this was one of her heroes. They need to really look at what this person was all about. How many know what eugenics was? It was huge in the United States before World War II. They were forcing, sterilizing women because they thought they were inferior. Had no say in it. The reason it stopped in this country is because of what happened in Nazi Germany. It frightened the politicians in America, so they put an end to it. Had that not happened, there would still be eugenics in this country. It started here. It didn't start in Nazi Germany. It was just taken to an extreme there. The death camps, not just sterilization. Sanger's impact during her lifetime was highly negative and included the Cruelty of forced sterilization, which became a common practice. In America, over 60,000 people were sterilized against their will. And most occurred during the 1930s and 40s, when Sanger and the birth control and population control movements were pushing states hard to enact and enforce compulsory sterilization laws. 
Sanger's legacy today, which is being carried on by Planned Parenthood, includes the devastating impact of birth control on the black community. Do you know the majority of Planned Parenthood clinics are in black neighborhoods? Because the whole purpose behind it was to eliminate the weeds. She considered the black race to be weeds, human weeds. Planned Parenthood has continued to the practice of targeting the black population, over 30% of all abortions are performed on black women and close to 40% of black pregnancies in an abortion. So are we the ones that are spewing hatred when we're trying to counsel and help women? No, this is hatred. This is racism. In the U.S. since 1973, 595 million, 552,327 abortions. That sense, Roe vs. Wade. And this came from a countdown that's going up constantly. This is, this is the number from the beginning of the week when I got the statistics, but this countdown just keeps going. The population of the U.S. is only 326,408,000. So more than the population of the United States has been aborted. So it's not Roe vs. Wade, 1973. Worldwide since 1980, there have been 1,458,844,000 mm -hmm. abortions worldwide. Or a third of them. It's insane. It's absolute insanity. We talked about this morning in Sunday school about the practice of people sacrificing their in infants to Baal or the god Molech, they'd have a statue and they'd take their infants, live infants, and put them on the statue and let them fall into the fire and sacrifice it. Are we doing anything any different? We're sacrificing children for convenience. And then, you know, this church needs to stand up. It's not hate speech, it's love speech when we stand up. Moral issues like abortion are inseparable from the core beliefs of Christian, the Christian worldview like the image of God, to embrace abortion requires rejecting what God has revealed about both himself and about humanity. Jude 20 and 23, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our God, Jesus Christ, to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, Save others, snatching them out of the fire. That's love when we're snatching them out of the fire. If you know of somebody walking into fire, what are you going to do? That's the child, you're going to snatch them out. You're going to let them walk into the fire? We're all God's children. If you know people that are in sin, I know I, I focused on two just because society today are saying that that's hate speech. But it goes with all sin. As Christians, we need to confront people when they're in sin. Confront them in love. How do you do that when you're angry about it? You pray. You ask God to help you and give you the right words. And snatch them out of the fire. But Jude says we should be doing it. It's God's desire that all men be saved. But there's only one way to God. And that's through Jesus Christ. We have the message. We need to be reaching out to them. Now, I, haven't, I don't think I've seen them recently, but there used to be anti-abortion protests in Valley Springs every year. You know, you don't, if you can't join them, stop and offer them some water or, or thank them for what they're doing. They're encourage still, them. They're still in San Andreas at that uh, yeah, place. Uh, door. Door, to, door or something. It's on the corner of 49 Mountain Ranch. Mm -hmm. Well, when we see that. And they're out yeah, there. So. And now he's honking. Honk and wave them, encourage them, give them a thumbs up. You know, because there's taking a stand. You may not have the time, the ability to do that, but we're driving by, you know, that means a lot to them. It's always older people. When they know that other people are behind them. Let them know if you can stop so much, just let them know I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will give you strength. You know, because not all of us have the time. I understand that. But we can do our part. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Remember, like I said, it's God's desire that all men are saved. Are you saved this morning? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Do you need His help with sin in your life? 
He's here to help you. If you're here today and you need God's help or you need to ask Christ to come into your life, just slip your hand up for a second. Put your hand down. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the honesty of these that are here. Lord, at times we all need help. God, help us with the sin in our own lives. It says that we need to get the speck out of our eyes or the plank out of our eyes before we try to take the speck out of our brother's eyes. We need to get that beam out of our own eyes so that we can see. All of us have sin. Cleanse us, God, we pray. Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. Thank you for that, Jesus. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to be loving when it comes to confronting others. That you fill us with a spirit of love, your love, because sometimes we just feel anger. But that doesn't reach anyone, Lord. It just pushes them away. Fill us with your love by your Holy Spirit that we can reach out and love to those that are in sin and share the love of the gospel with them. Share with them how much you love them and desire them and how you gave your life for them, Lord. Help us to be prepared in season and out of season, Lord, with the gospel. We ask that, Jesus, in your precious and your wonderful name. Amen.